Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the great and wonderful privilege of looking together into the Word of God. As you ask your question about this verse or that verse, we're going to look at it together and see if we can understand what God is teaching. And in so doing, I'm trusting that I will be learning and that you will be learning from the Word of God because it is the ultimate source of truth. It is the ultimate authority in every area in which it speaks. So let's take our first question tonight, please. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, good evening, Brother Canby. Yes. Yes, um, I have uh, some scriptures for faith and salvation and works. I'm well, sorry, I... could you speak a little bit or, uh, more into your phone? Okay, yes, sorry. Um, I have some scriptures about faith, works, and salvation. Um, could you read Romans 4, 2 and 3? Romans 4, 2 and 3. There we read Romans 4, 2 and 3. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now... What is your question? I have. I, I want to tie in um, another scripture with that, and the same uh, Romans four nine and ten. Romans four nine and ten. Yes. Uh, Come with this blessedness upon a circumcision only, or upon a circumcision also, uncircumcision also, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Uh, how? Uh, how was it then reckoned when he was in uncircumcision or in or in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Now, what is your question? Uh, my question is: the faith that was given to him before God God planned it long ago to give us this faith before we was even created, that we would do good works. Yeah, you know, these verses are very, very difficult. I, in, in years past, I have spent umpteen hours uh, studying these and praying for wisdom and wondering how in the world do we understand these, because as it is stated here, uh, Abraham believed God and and it was counted unto him for righteousness, as if it was his faith that counted unto him for righteousness. But when we understand... It doesn't say that. Excuse me, excuse me. What we, uh, what we, uh, the way this should have been translated, and the Greek absolutely allows for this. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and he... The word, the Greek uh, uh, word for it is the same Greek word for he, and he it refers not to Abraham, it re refers to God. God was counted unto him for righteousness, because Abraham uh, had no righteousness in himself at all, and he had no faith in himself. That had to come from God. And the, this verse, which incidentally is found three or four times uh, in other places in the Bible, it's repeated. And it's really been a difficult one to understand. But once we understand that he is the one that was reckoned, uh, just like in verse 9, cometh this righteousness then upon the cir circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. That is, those who, the uncircumcision, are those who are the Gentiles. For we say that faith, he was reckoned 
to Abraham for that faith. That is, the faith of Christ was reckoned unto him for righteousness. Uh, how was he then reckoned? Uh, how was he then reckoned when he was in uncircumcision or in, un, in, circum, in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Uh, th this, this passage, uh, 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 for example, uh, where it says, was reckoned, should be, he was reckoned. Uh, just as it's found in the same uh, phrase is found, let me see, in Luke chapter 22, verse 37. Let me see. I made a note one time about that. Let's see once what that says. Luke 22, verse 37. We read where we have exactly the same Greek language. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned amongst the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. That phrase, he was reckoned, is identical to the phrase that is found in Romans chapter 4, verse 9. It should have been translated. We say that, that uh, the faith, that he, that, that faith, that's Christ. He was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And now we are in complete harmony with everything else the Bible teaches. But if we don't understand it this way, and it's very, very uh, uh, faithful to the Greek language in the way uh, we, I'm, I'm stating this, uh, we, if we don't understand it this way, then we're going to be at complete odds because Abraham's faith was work that he did. And that can never be reckoned for righteousness because our works uh, can never make a contribution toward our salvation. But Christ, his work, his, the fact that he did all the work to save us, that is what brought Abraham righteousness and brings us righteousness. Ephesians 2.10 states that Christ did that beforehand. That's why I'm trying to uh, emphasize that people can understand that Christ said it in two, Ephesians 2.10. He says right there, if I may read it, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. So through him, he prepared for us that we will walk in it because he did it for us already. That was, let, that's why excuse me. Let's look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, God is saying we are his workmanship. And it's nothing that we have done. Our works have not been made a contribution. We are his workmanship, uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Christ did that, uh, made us his workmanship so that we would be trusting in him. That is, he saved us. And then as a result of salvation, yes, then we believe in him because that's a good work that c flows from those who have become true believers. But you know, it's super dangerous. It's absolutely terribly dangerous if we have any kind of a salvation idea where my work made any contribution to it. And the Bible is very clear in First Thessalonians chapter 1 that faith is work. And if we are trusting in any way in our work, when we go back to the Old Testament, God sets up the example of someone who did a little bit of work on the seventh day Sabbath, which was a sign, uh, it was a portrait pointing to the fact that even as the Jews in the Old Testament were not to do any work of any kind on the seventh day Sabbath because it was pointing to the fact that Christ did all the work to sanctify us. And if, uh, and God gives the account in Numbers chapter 15 or chapter 16, where somebody did a little bit of work on the seventh day, on the seventh day Sabbath, 
And, uh, and uh, Moses asked God, what shall we do to this man? And God said, execute him, stone him to death. And they stoned him to death. It's a portrait of the fact that anybody who's got a gospel, and that's the common gospel in all the churches, that we are to believe, we are to repent, we are to uh, get ourselves baptized. And in this way, we became saved. And that is terrible. It is, it is, it, if we re- or study the whole Bible, it means that all these dear people that have been taught that are guaranteed to come into the day of judgment because they have a gospel in which they're trusting in their work, like the man who did a little bit of work on the seventh day Sabbath. They're going to be executed in the day of judgment. But th- thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hampton? Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing today, sir? Very well, thank you. I- on May 21st, 2011, when the rapture takes place, and I don't understand why God wants to draw the bodies into the street, but that's not my question. My question is, when does the people start taking the mark of the beast where they can sell and buy? Because the Bible says that no man can, no man is going to enter heaven whoever no, takes the mark of the beast on him. You're reaching into Revelation 13, which is discussing the role of Satan during this present time of the Great Tribulation that began 22 years ago and will end on May 21 when the Day of Judgment comes. Uh, right now, today, if uh, to buy or sell has to do with bringing the gospel. God uses that figure of merchandising. Like, for example, we read in Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's the cry of the merchant. And God uses that as a picture of us sending forth the gospel. And to buy or sell, is, it has to do with, uh, with bringing the gospel. But when Satan is ruling it, during the Great Tribulation, which we are coming near the end now, when he's ruling in all of the churches... Uh, and anybody there comes with a, the true gospel. If, 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 if I were invited to come in to, to preach in any congregation, I'll guarantee to you that in five minutes they'll throw me out on my ear because I do not bring the gospel that they uh, want to have there, what they're buying and selling. Only those who have the mark of the beast. Now, the beast is Satan. To have a mark of the beast means you are owned by Satan. And those who are, like we read in Second Corinthians chapter 11, Satan comes as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. They are the ones who have the mark of the beast that is their own by Satan and they can freely teach in the churches and preach in the churches uh, but if someone comes with uh, who is a child of God and coming with the truth no, yeah, they, they will never, never allow it it will, could, cannot happen All right. but thank you for thank you call- Mr. Canton thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 to 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to 8. There we read. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, or actually that word make is in the, in the original language means I will finish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, and so on. Now, what is your question? Uh, could you explain what these different covenants are? Yes. You see, I, the uh, when we read the Bible, it is a whole series of uh, illustrations and portraits of what the gospel is. It talks about uh, going through the Red Sea, uh, go, uh, crossing the Jordan River. It talks about Israel coming out of the land of Egypt. It talks about uh, offering burnt offerings and blood sacrifices. It talks about a uh, water baptism and the Lord's table. These are all, uh, and are just the, the Bible is all ha both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament has all these figures and pictures and portraits. But that is not the essence of salvation. Uh, and yet that is what the churches have tried to follow. They have put, like the Old Testament Israel, they made a big deal about making sure that they kept the uh, Sabbath day and that made sure that they offered the right sacrifices and so on and believe that in so doing, that was getting them right with God. In the New Testament, uh, the churches have made a big thing about water baptism and about the Lord's table. If you, you, all you have to do is go into any, any ch church almost, almost any church, and you'll find uh, the baptismal tank is featured in the, uh, behind the pulpit, and you'll find the communion service is featured. Uh, uh, that is what... Uh, where the big focus is. But the, the covenant that, that has actually been in vogue from the beginning, but has hardly been looked at at all or understood at all, and now is in view with great, great, uh, 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 serious now, uh, seriousness now, is a covenant that is strictly spiritual. Strictly spiritual. It, is, it was typified by all these things and all this tremendous amount of information in the Bible, uh, which was here, uh, what it's talking about here as the first covenant. But it, none of that got anybody saved. No one became saved. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, but when we, uh, unless we go understand the spiritual, the fact that all the work was done by the Lord Jesus. That we cannot do anything. Right? We can we can offer sacrifices. We can try to repent. We can try to believe. We can do this. We can do that. And all all the things that seem like we have been commanded to do that will achieve salvation, and it'll never achieve salvation. That's why finally he said in uh, in uh, verse ten. For this, this is Hebrews 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And, and it's in our day when we are uh, getting the final in-gathering. And it's a big in-gathering. Uh, uh, far more people becoming saved in all likelihood than ever became saved during the era of the, nation of, of, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, being a custodian of the Word of God, or the church age, when the churches were commanded to send the gospel out into the world. In these days, uh, because after these days is, is a phrase that God uses uh, to explain what's happening in our day, the final 6,100 days of the history of the world before Judgment Day begins and, and the rapture be, uh, it takes place. After those days, I'm reading verse 10, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind. Now notice who's doing the action. The Lord says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their heart. 
I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, uh, 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 Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Uh, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, and will I remember no more. Now, what he's saying is the action of salvation uh, it has ultimately, while they, these are pictures, uh, water baptism and blood sacrifices and going through the Jordan River and all oh, uh, thousands of other things, that have been uh, indicated in the Bible, or maybe at least hundreds of other things, are they that will not get anybody saved at all. Christ has to do it all. It was already very carefully set forth in Ezekiel chapter 36, and that's why God is saying here he will finish this new covenant. Uh, it was explained there, but no one really understood it at all. But in our day, as we are finally sending the gospel out into the wor world. You notice in Family Radio, we are not talking about water baptism. We're not talking about uh, uh, any of these signs or, or, or the Lord's table or ever. We're just saying to people, cry out to God for mercy. God so, has to do all the work. That's the new covenant. So it's not talking about the Old Testament of the Bible versus the New Testament of the Bible. No, not at all. Not at all. The, or the Bible is one unit. Uh, you can't separate. Well, well, we have find it separated because uh, there were 400 years uh, 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 between the writing of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament uh, was before Christ came and uh, came to demonstrate what salvation is, uh, and the New Testament came to demonstrate that and really to begin to show us how the church age would develop. But nevertheless, it is all together one covenant, one covenant. And, well, thank, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay, uh, you, a long time ago you had a caller that says that the King James Version needs to be corrected or that the King James Version translators did not correctly translate the Bible. For instance, Genesis chapter 1 1. Well, the fact <laughs> is that no. Bible is uh, the, you remember the translators they were not divinely inspired they were theologians who did their very best with the knowledge that they had or their understanding of the Bible that they had to make an adequate translation but uh, but uh, uh, in our day because God has opened our eyes to so many truths that were not known to those translators and that impacts uh, from time to time a verse uh, uh, because we have a lot more understanding of the Bible and so a word may have to be changed although it's remarkable how well the translators did do it only happens from time to time but when it does we don't hesitate uh, to make that correction uh, recognizing that uh, that uh, the original language is the only thing that cannot be connect corrected. If we if we are if we're reading a verse and we have a real trouble with it, and if we think if the original language could have a little different word in it, then that verse would make sense. We will we're absolutely doing something altogether wrong. If that verse is really hard to understand, it means there's a beautiful truth hidden way deep in it, but we have to patiently wait for God to open our spiritual eyes, and we will never correct the original language. Of course not. Yeah, it's almost like, it's almost like you know, uh, you know, not only you have English speakers, you have people from China, Japan, 
uh, India, everything, you know, you would have to translate the best of your ability into the original language into English. What some people do is they translate the English language into into the, you know, Spanish, for example. Well, it it, it is, they do that, uh, and... Uh, uh, but uh, we are dealing with the English language. We, we try to make a correction, and then we are trusting that that, that other true believers, if they are French-speaking or uh, Spanish-speaking, that they will uh, try, make the same correction in their Spanish language or their French language. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Campion. How are you? Very well, thank you. Great. Uh, I was just, uh, I'm going to give you my question, and then I'll, I'll show you the scripture. But all over, every denomination, I, I was part of the church as you were for many years, but you know it real well, much better than I do, that's for sure, that they always use the name of Jesus no matter what in every denomination. So if you would, can you turn to Matthew chapter 10? Matthew chapter 10. Uh, let's see, 32 and 33. Let's look at that. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. There we read... Uh, whosoever therefore shall confess me before man, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me for, before man, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now, what is your question? My question is, could you relate that to Revelation 19, verse 13? Revelation 19... Verse thirteen, and uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have to pause, and I'll be right back with you right after this pause. We have a caller who has asked the, the question to relate Revelation nineteen verse thirteen with Matthew chapter ten verse thirty two and thirty three. Now Revelation nineteen verse thirteen says it's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, so we know it was Christ. And his name is called the Word of God. That ties in with John 1. Of course, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so Christ is the very, uh, uh, he, is the, he is God. And it is God who has written the Bible. And God is completely identified with the Bible. It's, uh, you can't separate God from the Bible. When we worship uh, God, we're, we also hold the Bible in a tremendous, tremendous awe and respect because it identifies with Christ. Now, I don't know how that identifies. For, uh, uh, of course, they're both uh, factors of or features of the gospel where it says in 32 and verse 33 of, uh, of uh, Matthew 10, uh, for whosoever there shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Uh, 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 but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Actually, Christ said, I and the Father are one. When we, uh, to confess be, is, is to be of the same mind with God, and it is to recognize that Christ is the Word of God. I suppose we could find that connection. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. For the camping. Yes. Yes, um, I'd like to ask you where in the Bible, I think it's in the New Testament, but I don't know for sure, where is it uh, I can know how to pronounce or know how to write the letters? like the consonants that they say um, in the Hebrew language of the Old Testament. Where in the Bible, how to pronounce the Hebrew letters? Yeah, and write you, it, like like it shows you how to write it. Yeah, uh, you can, yeah. 
uh, how to pronounce them, uh, the Bible doesn't help us at all. And uh, I, I think Psalms 119, it has like a... Well, excuse me, I, that, if you want to uh, look at the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew alphabet, you can find that in Psalm 119, because it is divided up into the 20... Two letters, I believe, of the Hebrew, of the Hebrew, uh, but, that it, only but help it is does not give a, a way to pronounce it. And it I'm only not sure. helps you pronounce the verb tense up that, that part of the part of the whole consonant, how whole letter, the consonants. It doesn't. Yeah. It's just part of it. It doesn't pronounce. It helps you to first. First of all, I need to find out how to know the whole writing and the pronunciation so that I can go yeah, well, to Psalms 119 uh, and study that. Yeah, excuse me, no. Let, uh, let, 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 what, how we pronounce a Hebrew or a Greek word it has nothing to do with understanding the Word of God. That has nothing to do with that. Nowhere in the Bible does God make pronouncing a test. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew of the Old Testament was written, completed over 2,000 years ago. And I'm not sure that anybody today knows how every Hebrew word, but I don't care how authoritative they are in the Hebrew language, know how they pronounce these words exactly in the old, uh, 2,000, over 2,000 years ago. Uh, they may, uh, uh, but how we pronounce words, that is not the, uh, not the issue. What is the issue is what are the letters, and we read those, and uh, that is what God has given us, but he has not given us any pronunciation help. Well, In fact, as a matter of fact, about 500 years after the Bible was yet, uh, was written, the Masoretics, uh, uh, they were a, a Hebrew group, and they uh, went through the Bible and gave valve points uh, yeah. on different words in an effort. Yeah, the verb. Uh, excuse me. Vow. Yeah, a, a, the vow, not the verb, the vow. In, in an effort to help people, uh, and it actually, uh, therefore, uh, at times it affected the, the, the word and, and gave a different meaning. And so when we are studying the Hebrew, uh, and comparing scripture with scripture, we never pay attention to the valve points, val the the vowel points, because they were added, and they are not divinely inspired, and we cannot trust them. But thank no. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Yes, sir. He said that uh, in order to be saved, you have to be begging. Did you start begging already? How do you know that you are saved? No, in order to be saved, we have to wait upon God. We cannot get ourselves saved in any way. Uh, if we start, uh, we can plead with God, uh, God, uh, and beg God, and and uh, maybe He, maybe He will save us. But God saves people uh, as little babies. He say He can save a baby in the womb. Uh, God, no, did you God, start? Uh, God will do the saving in His own way. But He gives us the privilege. He gives us the privilege of crying to God for for mercy, pleading with Him for mercy, and maybe, maybe God might save us. That is the that is a a privilege that God gives us, but it has nothing to do with a, 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 the fact so that now we're making a contribution toward our salvation. So everything is uh, maybe, maybe, in uh, maybe, maybe, that means 50-50. Well, you see, it has to be maybe, because everyone whom God finally saves, their sins were already paid for before he ever created the world. And we have no idea whether we're one of those at all. Nobody knows ahead of time. Only if we do find ourselves saved because we uh, begin to find an intense desire 
uh, to do the will of God. And we find that we, uh, we uh, are really broken before God and uh, recognizing that we deserve the wrath of God. And, uh, and we, we don't know, uh, how we find there's a huge change in our life. Then we, uh, we may know that it's only because God has elected us and made provision for our salvation before he ever created the world. But we can't know that ahead of time. Nobody can. And uh, it's all, everything is in the hand of God altogether. He has a perfect plan, but we don't know what the plan is when it gets down to the very individual. So we have the privilege of crying to God for mercy. He encourages us to do that, but uh, because uh, uh, we come, first of all, it, uh, we can examine our own life. Are we really, are we really, uh, 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 really uh, serious about this? That that we are, that we deserve the wrath of God. But even if we are, that doesn't make a contribution. It all finally has to be done. Uh, 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 according to what God has already planned. But thank so if you. if everything was done by God, then why do we still have to beg mercy? Yeah, well, now you see, the, the, uh, there are a lot of people that therefore want to take a fatalistic attitude. Well, if I, if he has saved the ones that he planned to save, that has made payment for it, then anything that I do won't make any difference. And in one sense, that is correct, of course. But on the other hand, uh, we, don't, we don't tell God what, what, uh, what uh, we think. We, do, we, do, we don't check out God and say, well, then God, then this follows. God does not teach anywhere that, uh, that uh, well, look, I've chosen the ones that, I plan to save, and you don't have to worry about it. You can live any kind of life you want uh, because you're, you're going to get saved. He doesn't teach that anywhere in the Bible. He talks about uh, crying out to God for mercy and coming with a broken and a contrite heart. And we better not try to dictate to almighty, infinite, uh, perfect God what we think about his plan of salvation, we just simply, simply very, very, very humbly follow it and, and recognize that not one of us deserves salvation at all. And yet, how can it be that he does save some? And so we, uh, we uh, try to follow what God is telling us, even though we don't understand a lot of things about it, and we never, never try to get smart with God and say, well, then, and draw conclusions of, uh, of uh, it's all by fate and so on, that the Bible does not uh, teach us. Mr. Camping, Mr. Camping, I think you don't understand uh, about salvation. Salvation is you have to accept Christ with faith, and you have to do works, because faith without works is dead. I think uh, one of the uh, first callers uh, talked to you about that before. And uh, God is not going to come next year. Uh, yes. That's a false doctrine that you have, sir. He is not going to come. Yeah, well, the fact is, that is exactly what all the churches are teaching. But accepting is a work that we do. I will accept Christ. Now, how in the world... Do we know whether he made payment for our sins? And we're not the we're not the uh, uh, the prime mover in this. It's God's work altogether. We're the despicable sinner who only deserves the wrath of God. And yet, in our arrogance, in our pride, we are saying, "Well, if I accept Christ, uh, my my, we put ourselves in a." in a position of deciding whether I'm going to get saved or not. And frankly, frankly, it's all terribly wrong, terribly wrong. It violates all kinds of laws of, Bible, of the Bible when we proceed in that direction. But I, I, can, I can empathize with what you're saying, because what you're saying is precisely 
what is taught in most of the churches and virtually all of the churches. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, sir. Yes. Just two scriptures, please. Uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, yes. In what verse? Just 1 and 2. 15, verse 1 and 2. There we read in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Then drew near unto them him unto Christ all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And they are the lowest of the low. They are were looked upon by uh, the the church uh, of that day, the Pharisees, as scum. And uh, then the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man, that is Christ, receiveth sinners and eateth with them. In other words, how would he dare pollute himself by having this close company with this scum, this, these people? Who are who are obviously in complete rebellion against God? Now, what is your question? I just have one more little passage and one question. After, if you would turn to the left, uh, Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two. Fifteen and sixteen, please. Mark chapter two. Verse 15 and 16. There we read. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it? that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. Now, what is your question? Okay, sir, one question. Is this a perfect picture of this exact time that those people outside of the churches are getting fed the Word of God while the people on the inside of the churches are totally persecuting this crazy gospel that we're in the latter rain and the end of the world is coming? The churches in the outside, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you have to repeat that. I didn't quite understand you. Okay, sir. Uh, it seems that I, I have a couple family members and coworkers who are in the churches big time, and they think it is absolutely insane not to go to church and to go outside the church on Sunday and study the Bible. And the fact that Jesus is the Word of God, is it a picture of all the sinners with Jesus on the outside of the churches eating and drinking the gospel with him while the Pharisees and Sadducees think it's crazy? Well, yeah, it is a portrait. It is a portrait. The same thing was happening in the nation of Israel. Remember, for 1,480 years inclusive, they were the... Uh, the uh, a divine organism uh, or that God had established to take care and to be the custodian of the, of the gospel. And yet they got so bad in their understanding of truth that when Christ came, who was the very essence of the gospel, they wanted him killed. They couldn't see for dust that he had anything to do with the truth of, of God's word. And the same is true at the end of the church age. It's uh, history as du duplicates itself. Uh, in, at the end of the church age, the churches don't want anything to do with the truth. They want to stay, just stay with what they have understood to be true, and they're not listening to the whole Bible. And so they look at those on the outside as being, as just being, uh, uh, like you use the term crazy or out of our minds that we have become we've lost it somewhere along and uh, and uh, this this uh, this is uh, uh, this is exactly what the bible is 
teaching. But you know, it's interesting. Again and again, God uses the phrase uh, in, uh, in connection with the end time that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And that's a very, very uh, frightening statement because the first are those who've had the Bible for years and years and years. That is, those who are in the churches. And they shall be last. That is, that's a figure that indicates they'll be left out. Now, the first, the last, are those who have never had the Bible. Two-thirds of the world know nothing, virtually nothing, about the Bible, except now they are hearing a few verses, namely, that Judgment Day is almost here, that the rapture is coming very shortly, and that they can cry out to God for mercy and, cry, and, and wait upon God for mercy. Just a very few phrases are they hearing, and yet these who are last are the ones who will be first. That is, they will be the ones who will be entering into the kingdom of God, while those who are in the churches who have been first uh, they will not, they will be last. They will not be coming in. And that does, that relates to these verses that you are offering. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Hello. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, yeah, you turn the radio I off, please? Yes, I did. All right, question. Uh, I was just listening a few minutes ago, and you were uh, discussing with another uh, gentleman there about salvation, of course. When Adam sinned, did he write off the whole human race or some of us? When Hello? Adam sinned, did he write off the, the whole, whole human race? race or only a few of us? Well, the, when Adam sinned, Adam was the head at the beginning of the whole human race. Every one of us mm -hmm. come from the bloodline of Adam. Okay. And so when he sinned, we all sinned. We all uh, became subject to death. That is, we lost our divine connection with uh, Christ, uh, and, uh, and uh, we became subject to physical death uh, uh, because the wages of sin is death. Okay. And that's what salvation is all about, that no. uh, in the human race, uh, there's one here and there's one there, that God is, uh, has reinstated into the kingdom of God by making payment for their sin so they don't stand guilty under the law of God, and, so, and, and also giving them a, an eternal soul in which they'll never sin again to, to prepare them for that wonderful gift of eternal life and being co-heirs with Christ in okay, the new when, heaven and the new earth. All right, so Mr. Campin, so when Adam sinned, neither you nor me was there. Now, and I believe you're doing a wonderful job in family radio. Would that be fair to you that when Christ died at the cross, did not die for your sin? Well, it's not a matter of, you know, not, the fact is, uh, not only uh, did, did, are we in the blood of, uh, of Adam and therefore we sin, but we sin. We sin. We are. Yeah, but the, the question are, I'm asking, Mr. Kemp, and the question I'm asking, would that be fair, after all the work you have done in family radio and making, uh, helping people to uh, learn about the Lord and, and give their life to the Lord, with all the wonderful work you have been done, would that be fear to you that Christ came and decided not to die for you? So in other words, when you are teaching that only those that he died for, we got to understand that salvation is only for all those that accept him as the Lord and Savior. He died for them. So now we have you a know, choice. You, 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 you have no idea what you're really saying, you know. <laughs> you know, God, here, look, look. Here is mankind. Uh, and even those who, uh, and only a very tiny percentage, actually get the gift of eternal life. But all mankind, as they uh, obey the law of God to any degree, can have a wonderful life here on this earth. That's why when we talk about 
May 21, 2011, as the day of judgment, nobody wants to hear it. They don't, they don't want this world to end. They think this is where they have their friends. This is where they enjoy the warm sunshine. This is where they can eat these beautiful different kinds of foods, these tasty foods. This is where they can have their career. This is where they can see their children grow up. And this is all the love and the and the, and the mercy of God. He has mercy on everybody in the whole human race. And, and, and nobody, nobody deserves anything beyond that. The fact that there's a tiny percentage that he actually uh, gives them eternal life and, and the great gift of reigning with him forevermore. That's, that is just beyond our imagination. Why would he ever, ever, ever do this? But uh, don't, ever, don't ever say that God has shortchanged people. He is, uh, he is like, like, like I, I, let, let me read to you from, from uh, Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't recognize these things. We, the, the reason that man gets in trouble is because of sin. If you are breaking God's laws and, and you're living in adultery, or if you are uh, uh, stealing, or if you're lying, or if you're uh, sure, then you're going to have a lot of troubles in this life because you're breaking God's law. But if you live a moral, a decent moral life, you can find that this world is very, very, uh, uh, a very, very good place to live. And... And, and then finally you die. Your death is not any more, uh, uh, more painful than the di- death of someone whose pain- sins have all been paid for. And so don't say for a moment that God has shortchanged anybody. Do any of us, anybody, deserve the wonderful life that they can have here in this world, completely apart from salvation? Does anybody deserve that? No. No. Because if we examine our life carefully, we find that every one of us sins. And, and that's the wages of the law of God is the wages of sin is death. And therefore, that person ought to die instantly when he commits his first sin. I, I agree with you, Mr. Campion. I agree. No, I can't agree any more than that. I agree with you. The question that I asked, however, a person like you that live in I assume you live in Rachel. You have a wonderful uh, program, Family Radio, being listened to all over the world. A lot of people are giving their life to the Lord because of your program. My question was, would that be fit to you if at the end time, May 21st, come here, and you realize that Christ did not die for your sin, but he died for the sins of other people, perhaps another sinner, perhaps a person that was not doing Family uh, Radio? Excuse me. I am no more entitled to salvation than anybody. Uh, if you think that I have lived a sinless life, forget it. There's nobody that has. And the Bible teaches in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if we break the smallest commandment, we're guilty of the whole. And so, uh, in a lifetime of living, of course, there are many, many sins. I, I, I don't deserve salvation any more than anybody deserves salvation. Not at all. It's only the mercy of God. Only. I, 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 I wonder again and again all through my life. I've wondered why has God saved me? I'm sure, surely not any more deserving than anybody. And it's our, because uh, the moment that we sin, we deserve the wrath of God. And that, and I can tell you that in a lifetime of any human being, I don't care how righteous they may look, there any time you sin, if if you if you are offended by somebody, or if you if you are, uh, have a, a little bit of anger against somebody, or if you're thinking proudly for a moment, all of that is dirty, rotten sin in God's eyes, and so. Nobody deserves this salvation. It's absolutely beyond my understanding why God would do that. But for me or and for anybody else. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. 
Good evening, uh, Brother Camping. How are you? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. What well, that's good to hear. I think I have some scripture that can shed light on what uh, was just spoken between you and the last caller. Psalm 116. You want to look at Psalm... 116. 116. Verses 1 and 2, 4 and 13. All right, Psalm 116. Hold on, I'll be right back with you, right after this message. We have a caller who has asked us to look at a few verses in Psalm 116. And like so many of the Psalms, some of them are just wonderful, wonderful in telling us really what salvation is. I love Jehovah. Now, it's the word Lord in our English Bible, but all the letters are capitalized to indicate that in the original Hebrew, it was the word Jehovah or Yahweh, however it's to be pronounced. But And so I'm, that's why I'm substituting the word Jehovah for the name, for the word Lord. I love Jehovah because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. To supplicate before God is to beg, to beseech, to cry out for his mercy. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. In other words, he has come to me and not me to him. He, first of all, came to me. Uh, uh, then in verse 4 it says, Then called I upon the name of Jehovah. O Jehovah, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. It's the be- it, we're begging for salvation. Uh, and... Uh, the, uh, we read in verse 6, Jehovah preserve it, the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Reach. And then uh, in verse 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. The, notice who did the deliverance? God did. Thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before Jehovah in the land of the living. I believe that... Uh, Therefore have I spoken. And that belief came uh, as a result of the fact that God had saved me. And uh, therefore I, I have believed. I was greatly afflicted. In, and uh, that is, it's emphasizing that, that before we're saved and uh, we recognize our terrible situation. That, and that's why we're crying out to God. But thank you. And verse 13 I will take the cup of salvation and call the name on the name of the Lord. And I'll take it only because God has given it to me. It's not because it was based on my action. Or no, I, I can never, never do anything to help me get saved. I will take it because it is a gift that God has put within me. He has given me salvation and therefore I will call upon his name but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum thank you mr camping for taking my call uh my question is i'm trying to get a little better understanding here on on the position of when we die if we are not a child of god what happens to us now you know i'm just remembering it wasn't that long ago i remembered hearing you teach that If someone dies, they're not a child of God, then the next thing they know, their conscious existence, would be they would be raised for judgment, to stand for judgment, be found guilty, and then removed into eternal damnation. But now, I know, but now I know that you're saying that that's not correct. So, now back then, you were sure about what you were talking about, right? I mean, I'm just trying to get an understanding. You weren't saying that that was possibly the way it was. Is that correct? Well, you see, uh, uh, I am a product of the churches. Uh, most of my life, I have been uh, very much in the heartbeat of a local con- of, a, of a denomination that I truly believed had the truth. And uh, all the denominations teach that the payment for sin is to be under the wrath of God forever and ever. Uh, to go for millions of years still under the the terrible suffering as a payment for sin. 
And later on in these closing years, I have learned that that was all wrong. It had, it had no biblical truth. And this has happened not because I'm smarter than anybody, but simply because we're living in a day when God is opening our eyes to all kinds of truths that he has not, not uh, uh, emphasized in, in uh, past, uh, past years. But in our day, we are really coming to truth. And now we learn that it's very simple. The wages of sin is death. When we die, we're dead. And we have never, never again conscious existence of any kind. And so a person can live on this world, in this world, living a very despicable, wicked life, being a terror to everybody. And then he dies, and that's it. He, uh, there's, uh, he never again has conscious existence. On the other hand, a person can live a very, uh, very uh, decent moral life, and yet he's never become saved, but he's tried to obey God's laws, and he's had a lot of happiness in this world as a consequence. A lot of good things have come his way, and then he dies, and again, he's dead. He never again has conscious existence. It's one, the one's death, is exactly as the others. And what, is, what exactly is the Bible talking about when it indicates things such as eternal damnation, fire, hell, and all, all those things when about it, that? What is the Bible it, talking about? When it uses the term eternal damnation, it means that you are dead forevermore. You will never, never, never re be remembered or come into mind uh, uh, you are uh, you are go d done with forever, ever more. God God gives us an illustration of that eternal in uh, Jude uh, verse seven. Uh, there, you know, uh, in in uh, the Old Testament, God speaks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and uses them as an illustration of judgment day. And when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, today they were uh, a, 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 a city that had no problem. And tomorrow, the fire and brimstone destroyed them, and so they were done. Now, that fire and brimstone didn't go on forever and ever. If you looked a week later, it would have all, it's, the, the cities were an, annihilated. They're all gone. And the fires have all gone out. And here God says in verse 7 of Jude, that little book just before Revelation, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and or going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire now is that saying then that we can expect the fires of that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be burning eternally no we know absolutely that's not that has not happened so how, what what does it mean in suffering the vengeance of eternal fire namely that those who are are destroyed in that fire are eternally uh, destroyed. They're eternally destroyed. They'll never come into existence again. Now, actually, that is a tremendous piece of information, and it identifies with so many things in the Bible, as the Bible talks about the, the, the uh, mercy of God all through the Bible. God talks about God as being slow to anger and, uh, and that he is uh, very merciful. Uh, like, for example, Christ, who never ceased to be eternal God. He wept over Jerusalem because he knew that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. They, would, they were going to be all uh, dead and they'll never, never exist again. And yet, in his compassion, if we can think of this, that eternal God has those kind of emotions. 
uh, that is in his compassion he weeps over Jerusalem and in another place he says how oft I have gathered, would have gathered thee as a hen gathered his chicks and ye would not and he is weeping over their rebellion but ben, and like he says in another place he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked and now it all fits together when God finally destroys this world and uh, the people enter into judgment day yes it's going to be a horror 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 but the moment they're dead any individual and they'll be dying each day by the millions that's it they will not in- endure one thing more consciously their bodies will be uh, be desecrated as a shame a final shame in the eyes of god but they themselves will not experience one further uh, uh, thing at all uh, uh, because uh, because they are dead and they're, they'll never come to life again. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Romans 5, verse 1 through 11. Romans 5, let's look at that. Romans 5, there we read, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, and so on. Now, what is your question? Okay, read on down uh, into verse 7 through 10. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, what is your question? Christ did die for our sins, and this is the result of justification right there. And we can have a for sure hope in knowing that Christ did die for our sins. And I just wanted to share that with you, and I'm praying for you, okay? Thanks. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Cameron. Yes, what is your question? Uh, yeah, I'd like to take a look at, uh, let's see here, Jonah 3. Uh, eight. Jonah chapter three, verse eight. Oh, I'm sorry. There we seven. read. Jonah, Jonah three seven. I'm sorry. Yeah, three verse seven. Uh, the uh, the king Jonah has come. This strange prophet from the enemy nation of Israel, because Israel was an enemy of Assyria. And Nineveh was the capital uh, of Assyria. And here he comes saying, in 40 days, God is going to destroy this city because of its wickedness. And the king, amazingly, caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. 
Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Now, what is your question? Brother Cameron, I'd like to focus in on the last uh, theme of, of, of 7, verse 7, let them not feed nor drink water. And I'm wondering if we can compare that the water to the water that's in Jeremiah uh, 9 15. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 15 Jeremiah 9 verse 15 therefore thus saith Jehovah of hosts the God of Israel behold I will feed them even this people with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. Yes, I think that's fair. That's fair because this is the water of judgment, the water of God's wrath. And uh, and there, this is this language is, you know, somewhat parabolic because notice it says that not only did man, but the beasts, the animals, sat in sackcloth and ashes. Come on. Right. What does that mean? Well, the fact is that you know, God typifies mankind as an animal. Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep. Uh, or if we are not saved, we are, uh, we are uh, uh, some kind of an unclean animal. But the fact is that God uh, is using parabolic language, and I think that's a fair statement. They would not drink water. That is the water, uh, uh, or they, uh, uh, that, uh, how do they... Uh, how did he say that? In, uh, that uh, let them not feed nor drink water. That is, or it could even be uh, 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 looked at it in another way. You know, water has to do with a religious, uh, a, a religion of some kind. The true gospel is spoken of as the water of the gospel, and uh, these people didn't know where the truth was at all. They, that by normally, normally, or what would be the normal expectation is, they hear this prophet seriously warning them that God, whoever God is, uh -huh. is going to destroy them in 40 days. Now, these Assyrians, they worshipped idols. They had their gods. Uh, that was their spiritual water. And, uh -huh. uh, and uh, they could... Uh, they did not turn to that. They didn't begin to cry out to their gods. Oh, well, how, how, how save us. What can we do? What can we do? They only cried out to the God of Jonah. And so in that sense, also, that water could be, uh, be understood. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead with your question. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it really confuses me a lot on you saying, you using uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and saying that that's an example of uh, saying that the hell is not a eternal place. But, I mean, uh, ask me this. I mean, was it the people of Sodom and Gomorrah that committed the sins, or was it the actual city that committed the sins? Well, the fact is, Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of judgment, God's judgment. And, uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, when we look at Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they were destroyed by fire, and God calls that eternal fire. And it was not, it didn't mean that the fire burned forevermore. Well, then why did he call it eternal fire? Because it destroyed those so that eternally they would never, never live again. That's the only way that fire could be eternal. But thank you. Thank I mean, do you, do, you really, do you really think that, I mean, the only other argument that you could give on that, saying that, that hell would be an actual place, would be you have people over there dancing around in fire right now. I mean, that don't make sense. I mean, uh, 
he he can't have the uh, city completely sitting over there on fire and, and and then be able to say, uh, well, no, you know. Excuse me, excuse me. There's all this hap this conclusion happens to be in complete harmony with everything else the Bible teaches. It just simply says it very, very simply. But like, for example, when we read Second Peter chapter 3, in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That is, he's a thief in the night for all those who are, are uh, uh, not listening to the whole Bible. Uh, and, uh, and in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And it's not implying a fire going on forevermore here either. It, it's simply that in the book of uh, in the book of Jude, God gives us a very simple way to understand it. But it is a complete harmony with wherever we go in the Bible. And but we get we get snared by that word eternal, and uh, and we are snared by what we've been taught in our churches, because that has really been drummed in, you know, that if you are not saved, you are going to be suffering. And and these dear people don't realize, well, then if that means that the adults are going to suffer forever and ever, then your little two-year-old is also going to be suffering forever and ever and ever and ever. And you're... And you're uh, that little baby that was just born is going to be suffering forever and ever and ever and ever. You have to carry it all the way through. And it was a monstrously terrible teaching. A terrible teaching. The church has tried to get around it, you know, by talking about uh, uh, a time when uh, they're not, uh, children are not accountable for their sin. That's not taught anywhere in the Bible. Or they're taught that if they are baptized as an infant, then that somehow uh, protects them and gets them into the kingdom. That's not taught anywhere in the Bible. These are devices to get around with the terrible fact that, well, then if, if it means that damnation, the fire is going to be forevermore, the punishment is going to continue and continue for millions of years, then what about these babies? What about these little children? Go to Psalm 50 or uh, Psalm 58 and see what God says about little children. The wicked go astray from their mother's womb, speaking lies, and everybody is born wicked. And uh, and so you have all kinds of terrible things to contend with. And the only way the churches have contended with that is by adding some more doctrines that had no biblical basis of any kind. But I'll tell you. It was a teaching that really encouraged people to become a member of the church. And that was their desire to get members. And uh, and uh, the, the thinking that then they're doing God's will and also having people that can pay the bills and so on. I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit cynical when I say those things. I shouldn't really do that. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, the fact is when we, when we get... Uh, finally look at it all we find that was that what was being taught in the churches was a terrible 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 idea uh and and if if we really get really honest with it and and god is a merciful god and 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 don't ever forget that jesus wept over jerusalem that was heading for that end and uh, and that Christ has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We never, never really considered those things when we were in the churches. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Captain. Yes. Um, Psalm 36, verse 11. Psalm 36, verse 11. Let's go to that. Psalm 36, verse 11. There we read, Let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. 
There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Now, what is your question? Uh, what does this mean? Well, the first of all, foot and hand have to do with our will. Our will. And let not the foot of pride come against me. The tendency of mankind, and, and this is just the way we are designed because we are sinners by nature, we want, we are proud. We are, uh, we have a terrible time humbling ourselves before God and before our fellow man too. And, uh, and here it is a plea to God. Oh Lord, let not my will, the foot of pride, my, my will become proud that I, because I know that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Or he says a, a, a broken and a contrite heart I will not despise. And so if, if I am walking proudly, I am just, I, I am just indicating uh, out loud, if you were, if you want to put it that way, how much I am in rebellion of God. And thank you for I calling am. and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? We, I think we can take one quick question. Welcome, hi, Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Yes. Uh, could you could you look up uh, Amos Amos uh, six six? Amos six six. On the uh, uh, I think on the uh, oh my excuse me oh Amos five Amos five six. Amos five six. Oh, oh boy, I, oh, you know, I, <laughs> it is, Mr. Campion, it is 6, Amos yeah. six, 6, chapter Lord, 6. Uh, uh, let's read it quickly. Six, six, six Jehovah, six. and ye shall live, lest ye break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Uh, and uh, just how to understand this, no, in the time we have that, that left, there's, I don't think we can begin to understand this. Uh, it's uh, Bethel, I can say this, has to do with going into the churches because Bethel uh, means the house of God, the house of God. And God, when he spoke of national Israel in their day or the churches in our day, they were called the house of God. And we're not to try to find truth there at all. But that's the best that I can say in this couple of minutes. And so because we are come right to the end. And again, I want to thank each one who has allowed me to come into your home. I appreciate that. And I thank you for, for talking with me because I'm learning from you just as I hope that you are learning from me. And, and right now I have to say good night. <laughs>